Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for the kind invitation. For this talk, I brought you something of a personal pain point in my work as an independent uh, researcher and developer. I research at the Wigner's Institute of Physics, mainly quantum computing and post-quantum cryptography. But this one, the originating idea comes as my, from my work as an independent developer, namely um, private investor privacy. Uh, that's non-existent on on-chain, especially. So, for the agenda, I'll formally like uh, present the problem that I encountered way uh, sadly often in the industry. How prior work has been trying to address the problem? Why I think that didn't really work out the way it was supposed to? Then go a little deeper into the fiat world where I brought the original idea from. So how dark pools work for like decades in the fiat world and how I generalized the original idea, gluing together the components with zero knowledge cryptography. So the main problem that um, I personally encountered dis disappointingly many times is that um, Private investors in uh, token sales are super exposed, uh, either because the liquidity is so small that if you raise funds with the friends, family, and fools model, basically everyone uh, from the tokens team can call you when you are selling your tokens. Or if, uh, if the project is the other way around and it has super good liquidity, PR, and coverage in the industry, then basically bots are viewing you just like every time Vitalik moves Ether on chain, backshield alerts goes up and on Twitter and everybody knows that someone's exiting this and that token and it creates hysteria on the market. Like you can't really complete your order, even on a DEX, you can't complete your original order on the price you started it because either you are an exposed person onto the project, you are a developer who just wants to ex exit or an investor, or uh, a super large liquidity uh, person there. So investors get exposed and nagged uh, personally or just on Twitter, and I think um, that's uh, not really an ethical uh, stuff to do in the industry. And of course, there is still the threat of minor extractable value attacks, front-running sandwiching when such thing happens. And we already have token privacy solutions, right? Aztec protocol, uh, ZK Sync. But the problem there I encountered is that in threat modeling, it's the same. So if someone asks me, and it did happen, that, hey, is this person doing ZK Sync or doing Aztec protocol wrapping because he wants to exit? And you can check it really easily. Either just go on Etherscan, yeah? It's the wrapping contract. If you want to wrap uh, to zero knowledge transaction, it's that. Or if it's not the the flagged one that's on Etherscan and someone deployed their own version of Tornado Cache or ZK Sync for the privacy solution, you can still check by the code that, hey, the main investor is uh, sending funds to a contract that has code that's seemingly similar to some privacy solution. So it's still a red flag, it's not uniform. Like you are interacting with a contract that's supposed to bring some privacy it's the same issue. Backshield will just change the code and they will look for such interactions uh, on chain. So, how I personally formalized is that uh, the kickoff transaction, where you make the initial commitment that from here I'm trying to sell my tokens or interact with the chain in a way that I'm trying to hide my privacy, the very first transaction either has to happen on chain or has to be the last. Otherwise, you are uh, exposed to, to the environment for, um, for market hysteria this way. So enter dark pools. Um, in traditional fiat markets, it's like an age-old, a decade-old uh, technology. It's basically a central limit order book where the actual order book is secret, but only from you. Identities of uh, people who provide liquidity to the order book are eventually revealed. So it's not money laundering where it's uh, hidden forever, but they are only revealed when it's, it has no market impact anymore. So you can't front run it, you can't go hysteria mode when you see that Goldman Sachs is dumping a huge amount of stocks. When the deal is closed with the order price or uh, the limit price they negotiated with 
the counterparty, so it's an OTC trade, kind of. It enters the consolidated tape as an OTC trade, but it has an order book. And traditionally, this service is a trusted matchmaking service because someone has to see the order book so it can order it and connect you with your OTC peer who can fulfill your order. And this is the reason that traditional dark pools has a bad reputation because uh, if, the, if only they can see an order book which supposedly have super large liquidity investors with huge movements of funds or exposed people, if they can do price discovery, it's an arbitrage goldmine for them. And they did exploit this. So uh, in, in traditional dark pools, they did uh, collaborate with each other, so different dark pools, to do price discovery and go ahead of the market because they knew that the super large players, the whales, are sending on their dark pool. And uh, this is one of the reasons that most whales, so Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, they all have their own dark pools, so they can do the price discovery for themselves this way. But thankfully, this is a problem that um, we can solve with zero knowledge technology. And why uh, the traditional dark pool model is especially important right now, post tornado cash era, because it's formally regulated. So the US government formally allows operating dark pools as long, uh, I think the last amendment was in 2016 to the regulation national market system, which says that as long as dark pool liquidity does not exceed 6% of US GDP, then it's totally fine to do trades with secret order books as long as it um, as long as uh, it enters the consolidated tape of course after the trade so how zk will uh, or how i tried to glue this together uh, with zk is because the the trusted operator is a central server and can do uh, high frequency trading, price discovery and stuff. We can glue together all the, all the components that are prone to distrust between the parties using uh, a combination of blockchain and ZK here. And the protocol. There has been, uh, to best of my knowledge, two trials to build dark pools uh, on blockchain using zero knowledge. One is Deep Ocean, which I favor more than the other one. It has uh, it's more of an optimistic protocol than a prevention-based ZK. So it's, it's more about the accountability of the service. It's, it's still trusted, or like it's still centralized, but untrusted. Anybody can be the trusted dealer, and it has full accountability. So if some price discovery happens, or some cheating happens, then with zero knowledge, you can actually point to the uh, matchmaking service that it, it has been cheating. The problem with that, why I brought the idea uh, forward, is that it has no, sorry, my money, thanks. So it has no specifics, how do you handle the settlement with your connected peer, which is kind of the critical part, because okay, from the trusted services point of view, you just have to prove that, yeah, I made the, uh, the matchmaking correctly, hand over the protocol to the two peers, and then what? One of the, uh, two wallets have to transact first. And we just talked that in the threat model, the first transaction either is the last or something happens off chain. So uh, you can't really interact with a contract or something prior exposing your identity. The other one that I actually just recently uh, got knowledge of uh, is uh, Renegade Finance. They did a really good fundraising recently. They are completely trustless and decentralized with ZK. Their paper is amazing. I really advise anyone uh, to read it. But the problem I encountered there is not cryptographical or in the threat model. It's an engineering issue that it needs its own peer-to-peer -peer messaging layer on Quick to operate, um, which security-wise is not a problem. But if you are building something like, it's already way too hard to get people to use Ethereum with its own peer-to-peer -peer, uh, messaging layer and stuff. And if you are about to maintain your own, which has actually nothing to do with your product or project or open source uh, research, a peer-to-peer -peer messaging layer is a product on its own. So it's 
enormous amount of work to maintain and it just shifts focus from all that. So what I made is kind of the combination of the two. I called it um, Logtex. Uh, it's still an optimistic protocol. So all matchmaking, ser anyone can enter as a matchmaking service. It's fully accountable and doesn't need the, its own messaging layer. The threat model I formalized is that the matchmaking service is honest but curious, so it tries to get into, look into the hidden order book because it wants to do uh, high-frequency trading or arbitrage trading with, uh, with his peers. Thus, it cannot know the exact liquidity in the central liberal order book, only which side has more liquidity. This is the only uh, information I allowed in the model to leak into the order book. Neither any party can learn each other's uh, order sizes prior a settlement uh, protocol that you can't back out. Or if you back out, you have to reimburse the other party with more funds that is uh, in the trace so far. So your game theoretically really disincentivized to abort the protocol here. So the main components I used for this is because you have to reimburse the other party if you abort the protocol, is an escrow system. Then to avoid on-chain movements from the main accounts which leaks your identity, I used the create to deployment version. So you basically pre-fund a non-existent address on-chain with your funds. You commit with your main identity. I'll show in detail the protocol. This is just a high level. So you commit to your original identity, then fund a non-existent address on-chain with the funds that you want to exchange, and then deploy the create to contract on top of it, which uh, handles all the settlement. The two parties will negotiate between themselves the order sizes using Yao's millionaire protocol, and they create the settlement contract using Linda's two-party ECDSA with a public key that nobody knows the private key to. And to hide the, the which side originates the transaction, I use the newly merged account abstraction model in Ethereum. And of course, in each step, between each step, I use various zero-knowledge uh, technologies. I'm so far for the MVP, I'm using Halo 2 for every step uh, to prove correctness. So the escrow logic. First, uh, we commit to our main identities with a randomness that also has a nullifier because we have to ensure that at the end of the protocol, you can't settle uh, an order twice. So you commit to your original identity with a completely new wallet, so it's not your main one that has the enormous amounts of tokens that you want to exit. You commit one Ether uh, and register off-chain, maybe using Semaphore protocol. Originally, I used Semaphore for this, but it was too much because all of its anonymous messaging layer uh, used way more cryptographic technology than that I actually used here because for me, a simple ma set membership proof is sufficient. So you register with your commitment to your original account using a set membership uh, protocol, Merkle tree or a hash accumulator. I, pr I will prefer in my MVP a hash accumulator because that way I can uh, remove participants from an order book in constant time and constant size proofs, and I don't have to leak log and participants uh, from the order book to prove membership. Then the pool runs a FIFO matchmaking algorithm, so first in, first out. It turns out, and maybe this will result in an impossibility result, I'm still not there, that um, pro rata matchmaking will not work with this dark pool because for pro rata you have to see the order book because you match people based on their order sizes. So I either do randomized or very traditional FIFO matchmaking. When I'm doing uh, the FIFO matchmaking, I'm basically just comparing two different groups. So Alice registered on the seller group, uh, she gets a set membership identifier and the nullifier that you belong to ether sell and Bob is belonging to ether buy groups. The matchmaking system goes through in order N that, okay, I matched 
uh, two parties from opposing sides, acts as a turn server, so they connect through WebRTC. Web RTC. The pool acts as a storage server, connects Alice and Bob, and sends the proof that, hey, here is the proof of membership of your other side of the liquidity pool, or the order book pool, that I matched you with. They both verify this proof. Then they share randomness with each other that they prior committed to, because they have to check that does the other party completed the escrow pot protocol. So if they back out when I'm already committed my identity, can I pull out my one ether punishment from them? So uh, hence, they exchange randomness and check whether the escrow contract has the sufficient, uh, sufficient penalty committed then. So this was just the escrow logic. The matchmaking logic is much simpler. Part of it was on the previous sequence diagram. So uh, FIFO matchmaking runs. The pool sends uh, membership proofs to each party that they uh, that it matched together. And the two parties between themselves run the Yao's Millionaire multi-party computation protocol to check who has the larger order size, but still no amounts yet. So who's the winner? Alice wins here, which means that now we can switch to our main wallets uh, from the escrow ones. So far, all communication has a trace that, hey, I verified this proof. I got match made to Bob from the protocol. They both signed the whole trace, so they have to commit to the communication trace so far using Lindell's um, two-party CDSA protocol. And uh, during the protocol, so if you remember just before the last step, when you do something very similar to uh, ECDH, you have the two partial public keys. You also have to commit to those, because this is what's going to be used later uh, to connect this signature to the original identity. And you do a collaborative zero-knowledge proof that you did all this uh, Lindell's signature, multiple signature correctly, because that's also, a, 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 that's also a step that I have to hide your identity with the signature, so you can't s sign with your main wallet on chain. Thus, it can't leak your public key, but I have to ensure that you have your liquidity uh, to send the funds and you committed to it before. Hence, we need a collaborative ZK proof it's a combination of multi-party computation and zero-knowledge proof when the two parties generate the proof together, uh, a proof together that neither of them can do alone. And then they extract this Lindell public key for which they don't really know the private key to because it's a multi-party wallet. They extract the public key and pre-fund it with the funds, both of them, using the create to uh, protocol, so you just send it to the hash on chain. And you see here that Alice is making the first transaction, but so far it's not really a privacy issue because what's visible on chain is that Alice is moving funds to another externally owned account. So this address so far has no contract code or anything, it's just a random address so far. And when Bob sends the next transaction, that's the first part when you can kind of put together that okay, this is going to be an escrowed protocol or some kind of exchange because it's uh, clear that it's not neither of uh, the participants' wallets. But by this time, you can't back out from the protocol because you made the escrow and you uh, proved correctness of all the signatures prior. Then you share the commitment proofs if we did prior, the nullifiers, the pool either... Either the pool acts as a account abstraction uh, delegator or relayer, yeah, the, uh, relayer is the terminology, or you can introduce and send a user action to any other account abstraction relayer. It's, I just thought it's super convenient for the pool to act like it because it's gonna be fast. So the pool verifies the membership proofs whether the nullifier is uh, used up or not and then deploys the settlement contract to the already funded address, which has both sides of the tokens, matched made, uh, committed to, and covered by an escrow, then either the pool or anyone else 
commits the settlement contract, which has either that, hey, someone aborted or proof is not correct, give me my reimbursement, or give the other sides funds that they committed into the dark pool protocol. Then uh, the contract also verifies this, uh, whether the commitment and the nullifier is complete, not used up, and the dark pool protocol is done this way. And you see that until Bob made the, the transaction to the second one, it's still not clearly clear whether um, dark pooling is happening here, but by that time, nobody can back out from the protocol. And I thought, I really need just one slide on ZKAVM because I finalized the slide at the launch. There, the biggest problem in my protocol so far is the connection between the main wallet and the settlement protocol is still not very complete. So I tried to cover it with the escrow protocol and the various proofs and Lindo, but still it's uh, not uh, really complete whether the initiating wallet has the funds to complete the dark pool protocol because we can't leak the initial wallet. But with ZK EVM, that's not really gonna have a, or, or that's not gonna be a problem. And in the future, I'll dedicate an experiment to implement the whole and modify the whole protocol on top of ZK EVMs because that way I can even check the balance of a, uh, an address that I committed to prior. So I can prove that uh, a hidden wallet that I committed to here has enough balance to solve something and that uh, that would be the the killer application uh, on top of Renegade Finance. But so far all this works kind of guess efficiently on normal EVM without ZK EVM and uh, leaks much less than ZK Sync and Friends so far. Okay, my closing slide is seemingly missing from the <laughs> from the offline uh, version. So, okay, thank you for your kind attention. I will be around for your <laughs> questions. <laughs> Okay. When the second person like the loser, you mean? Uh, but there are two commitments. So first for the escrow and for, for uh, second for the settlement. Which one are you referring? For the settlement, yeah, because that's simply because they have to exchange fund funds. So. Both of them have to commit funds to the protocol that time. That can work, but then uh, because uh, Create2 also has the address of the deployer. So it's the hash of the deployer your random salt and then the code. And yeah, okay, you get. <clears throat> so it has to be a known deployer address, otherwise you don't know where to search for the other party's contract without another proof. So the legal issue is the main question here. Um, at the be beginning, I told I so basically considered the legal question solved by pointing to the act from 2016 that Lot Scott amended that, hey, dark pools are totally legal. So if you want to close me because money laundering issues or privacy issues, how come Goldman Sachs is operating a dark pool and dozens and dozens of uh, companies are operating fiat dark pools? It's still 6% uh, under US GDP, so I don't know whether that's a satisfying answer for lawyers or for you, but I do consider personally so that, hey, 
it's completely legal. Torrent cash was, yeah, really risky because you can wrap it under money laundering. It was not, but still, you legitly can label it as such. But dark pools legally, formally are not illegal. So if I made the dark pool on chain, why would it be any different? <laughs> We got to get to the break. We ran a little bit over on the last talk, but let's give our speaker a hand and uh, thank you.